Welcome to Second Tech, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM's debt and load shedding merged as central themes of Budget 2023. Chen Screamer joins me to discuss what the Finance Minister had to say about both issues. Hi, Terence. Hi, oh, Snow. The headline grabber was undoubtedly the 254 billion Rand ESCOM debt relief package. Yes, I think that is the headline grabber, and I think it's an important development on the electricity front. We know that Eskom's had this unsustainable debt of over 420 billion for some time now, and there was no way it was going to be able to trade itself out of that debt. So we got the message in the October and the medium term budget policy statement that there would be some sort of package. At that stage, a sort of debt transfer was mooted. That's not what we've got today. I think a more clean mechanism has been chosen in the sense that they don't have to go to bondholders and treat bondholders in any way differently, which could have triggered some sort of litigation. I think here we're going to have a series of transfers across to Eskom, which will be converted into equity, and they'll, they'll use that money over the next three years to pay off debt and interest that has been accumulated. And that's all Eskom is allowed to do with the money that's coming through from the National Treasury, which is from us, the taxpayers. There is a portion, though, in the later years, the 2025-26 financial year, about 70 billion, where there's going to be a transfer of debt across to the, uh, the national balance sheet. And obviously, there will need to be engagements with bondholders around that. But I think on the debt solution itself, it's it's fairly easy, much easier to implement. But obviously, it does have fiscal balance implications. So we're going to see a rise in our overall debt on, on the on the national balance sheet, uh, and it will mean that uh, we'll take a longer time to get our fiscal ratios in place. But I still think a cleaner solution in the end. The package comes with some interesting conditions. Yes, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of interest paid to the conditions attached. Some of these are quite normal. For instance, what I mentioned that this only use for this money is to pay off debt and interest accumulated on that debt. Eskom can't do anything else with it, which is important. But there are a number of uh, conditions in a, an annexure to the budget statement. And that annexure included uh, a statement around uh, um, transmission and making sure that Eskom doesn't invest in anything other than transmission and distribution, those two businesses that are being unbundled from uh, the utility at the moment, and is definitely not allowed to do any new greenfields generation investment. I did clarify that they are allowed to proceed with the, the Kamati solar project, which is part of the just energy transition financing that's coming through. I suppose that predates uh, this announcement, but any further uh, investment in generation is not allowed in terms of this relief package. Uh, and also there's going to be scope for the private sector to invest directly in transmission in some form uh, through private sector participation, probably build up the rate and transfer. So that's going to be interesting to watch. And it's a condition of the deal. But the most interesting element is that the National Treasury has appointed a team of international consultants that are going to go and evaluate Eskom's coal-fired power station fleet right across the fleet, assess its still workability and what fixes need to be made to improve it. And those have to be implemented. And we'll also assess whether any of these can be packaged or ready for concession. Uh, and the way it's stated is if this can be taken to an OEM type level standard, uh, original equipment manufacturer type standard, then it must, as the document says, be concession. So this is a whole new world. This is what a number of uh, observers said has been necessary to get the plant back into working order that we need the private sector concessionaires to come in. Uh, I think there's a lot more to come on this front. I think we'll have to see what comes out of uh, the international review, which will take place over the next few months. And uh, the consortium, uh, the names of the, uh, the companies involved has also been released by the National Treasury. And uh, so, so that's going to be interesting. But it basically what it signals is that what the core of Eskom should be is this transmission and system operator company. That's where it's allowed to invest with the help of the uh, uh, private sector, it seems. And then distribution is very important, whether that stays in the traditional ESKIM or, uh, or we'll have to see or whether it becomes one of many distributors along with the municipalities and others. 
but really this signals that Eskom generation, which is what we really know Eskom for, is not going to be the Eskom of the future. In many ways, uh, they're not one for one. They're not allowed to invest in that business in greenfields aspects of that business. Obviously, they must do the maintenance and the ongoing uh, investment around the fleet uh, to repair it and to get it back into some working order. But they're not allowed to do anything new, and therefore that gas project, for instance, at Richards Bay, seems to be off the off the agenda, uh, definitely uh, in the in the near term because they're not allowed to do that as Eskom. But in the future, Eskom generation is going to possibly be held in, in private concessionaire hands. And uh, the big question there is whether how long these questions, concessions will last. Will this be aligned to the integrated resource plan? Dead stop dates, will it be aligned to our de decarbonization offers to the, the United Nations? So that we, we need to see all that water flowing under the bridge. But I think these are very significant conditions. And this is a fairly significant development in the life of the electricity supply industry. There is also an assumption that this will only work in tandem with tariff pipes and with the user pays principle being honored. Yes, that point was made in the in the budget documents that this assumes that the 18.65% tariff increase that's already been adjudicated and approved by NERSA as well as the, the, the plus 12% of next year, that has to be embedded in this debt relief. Otherwise, it simply won't be sufficient to get Eskom on a sustainable footing. Now, this will be a shock to the public because we had the president himself at one stage calling for a halt to the increases. He did backpedal very, relatively hard in a newsletter a few weeks ago where he said, no, that the, the, the institution nurse has to be respected. And he did look for other mitigating factors. And I think in when the actual tariff is announced, we've actually only heard the revenue allowable revenue decision which has implication for the standard tariff, but when the actual tariff is announced, I think there will be some movement there to try and protect the most vulnerable electricity users, the, the sort of low consumption users. But I think what we are seeing today is that uh, the institution holds, and that's very important because NERSA is an institution uh, and you can't have politicians coming in willy-nilly and changing their decisions. It's very important. There is, of course, the court case that the opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, has taken and others to try and halt, among other things, it looks to halt the increase and the courts will have a say in this. But traditionally, well, on ESCA matters, the, the court has generally erred uh, on the side both of ESCA, but also on institutional uh, credibility. And that's why ESCA has won so many cases against NERSA is that Eskom has, uh, NERSA had been bre breaching its own rules. So for the court to go against that would be, I think, a tall order in this environment that's going to be painful for others. And then the other message was that we need to really embed across society the use of pay principle. This municipal debt to Eskom of 56 billion is a real problem. And there doesn't look to be any real immediate solution to that, but a process is being initiated to try and not let that debt climb further and to try to reset as part of this package. Whether we'll get anywhere with that remains to be seen, but it's also an important message. Outside of ESCOM, the minister also made announcements regarding renewables tax incentives and loan support for small firms. Yes, so, so as you can see, the whole budget was in some way sort of overshadowed by load shedding and movements, one, to get ESCOM on a sustainable footing, but also to try and get as much near-term new generation capacity into the system as possible. And the incentives for business look interesting. I think the incentives for households look pretty parsimonious at this stage. I'd have to really run the numbers and get expert advice on that, but it doesn't look like a dripping rose from a household perspective, but it's something. Uh, but uh, from a business perspective, it does look like the extension of the existing renewables uh, incentive and, and the amplification of that to a higher percentage um, is, is, is now embedded coming through. And then the second element or the second leg to supporting the small firms is a repurposing the, the bounce back loan scheme, which, is, which was announced really to help businesses recover from the COVID uh, lockdowns. And there was a 20 billion envelope that was set aside basically for uh, the Treasury or the, the, to back commercial banks in giving out concessional loans to small businesses. Some of that envelope has been absorbed, but it seems at least 8 billion 
is still available and that will be available to help small businesses invest in some sort of uh, generator capacity, whether that's solar or diesel generator. So I think that's also directionally a very interesting announcement. Well, the minister did make it clear that these this is not a sort of evergreen type incentive. It's really for the next, well, for the household, it's only for a single year, for businesses only for the next three years. And then obviously until the bounce back envelope is, is uh, exhausted. But it, uh, it is important. We know there's a lot needing to happen on the non-ESCOM generation front, and particularly now with ESCOM being told that it will not invest in any future generation greenfields beyond what it will be doing at Kamati. I think we're going to really need to see a massive scale up in either large scale, utility scale investments, um, or at all the way down to the household rooftop level. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.